Professor Sunil Sharma, welcome to Delhi. Uh, what was the origin of Indo-Persian culture? What were the areas where it, it started and who were its early practitioners in India? Right. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm happy to be here and to talk about a subject on which I have spent a large part of my career. Um, I'm um, glad you said Indo-Persian culture because um, usually we talk about Indo-Persian literature um, and although um, most of the sources for what we know about the formation and uh, development of Indo-Persian culture is, um, uh, is literary sources, um, you know, we really need to talk about a larger cultural phenomenon rather than just a literary phenomenon. Because if we um, only look at it from a literary point of view, then, um, then it's, it's really a literature written in Persian. So we might as well say Persian literature. Uh, but when that literature um, is, uh, is uh, tr uh, performed um, in a larger context in society, when it is adapted, it influences other works. Um, and, and, and studying the courtly culture that goes along with, um, with the, uh, the, that uh, Indo-Persian literature, then we can speak about an Indo-Persian cultural formation. Um, and uh, this is a culture of about a thousand years uh, or so. Um, and it is not easy to talk about it in general terms because Indo-Persian culture probably in its earliest phase was not the same as in the time of um, um, Amir Khosrow, for instance, um, his um, Indo-Persian um, society uh, in Delhi was very different from that of um, um, uh, the early um, Ghaznavids in Lahore or um, in um, Sindh. Um, and then when we come to the Mughals, it's a very different phase of Indo-Persian culture. Um, which is um, much more than before a large um, influence and um, uh, a kind of uh, appearance of Iranians on the scene. Um, uh, and then I would say the final phase of Indo-Persian culture um, in, from the late Mughal to the colonial period um, is really where you see much more of kind of many influences coming together of um, you know the the Persian of course um, but much more engaged with um, um, let's say Indic traditions for lack of a better term or local traditions in many places and then the colonial uh, influence and Western forms of culture coming in as well and this I would say is the um, roughly from about the 18th century till the early 20th, um, one of the richest, um, in some ways, more complicated um, phases of Indo-Persian culture. Um, and this is where I think a lot of interest of scholars is um, right now, um, especially with figures like uh, uh, Khane Arzu in Delhi, you have Khalid, um, and then ending with Iqbal, of course, um, uh, there's, there's a lot going on, uh, influences from, from many different um, uh, sources uh, coming together. What were the places like towns um, and what kind of patronage uh, where Indo-Persian culture and literature evolved? And who were the, the early practitioners, some, some of the poets? Right. Um, the the this, uh, backdrop for a lot of Indo-Persian culture was largely urban um, spaces, um, uh, which is true of uh, uh, Islamic civilization generally, was a very urban civilization. We have centers from um, Baghdad and Isfahan and Bukhara. And, and similarly, in, in, in uh, the subcontinent, you had um, uh, the earlier centers were, of course, Lahore um, and then Delhi. Um, where the courts, the earliest courts of the um, uh, rulers were, who brought Persian 
um, to this region. Um, uh, and then uh, Delhi, of course, was one of the, um, the main centers of Indo-Persian culture throughout the whole time that we are talking about. Um, the other places um, had an ebb and flow. Um, but what was very interesting is that the way that um, uh, uh, culture, a courtly culture would develop um, in these centers, um, whether in Delhi or Lahore, um, then they would, um, uh, uh, this, this culture would be transplanted to um, provincial centers so that um, regional governors would try to recreate um, the, 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 the way that uh, the court um, life was um, uh, uh, carried out and the protocols of courtly life so that you find in um, uh, over time in Bengal, in Gujarat, in Kashmir, Sindh and the Deccan, etc where you started having um, um, equally important centers of Indo-Persian cultures. Um, and what is more interesting is that in these regional centers um, um, where you would say that the, 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 they were sort of less strict about um, uh, being very Persian about these uh, this um, cultural practices, that there was an interaction with local um, practices in terms of languages, literatures, um, um, arts, uh, painting, dance, music, etc., where there's much more of, um, of an, um, uh, an interaction with local cultures, so that you get um, multiple kind of what I would call Persianate cultures, so that meaning that they are Persian in orientation, um, but, th but they also appear in um, different languages, in Dakhni, in the Deccan, in um, Bengali, in uh, Punjabi, um, in Gujri, etc. Um, but very much under the kind of the um, um, aegis of the Persian um, um, cultural norms. And um, so far I've talked about courtly culture and of course um, you, uh, there's the whole phenomenon of um, Sufi um, culture, which is also very uh, Indo-Persian, um, and um, and uh, it almost runs side by side with courtly culture. But there are many interactions. Of course, um, the courts always had contact with um, Sufi centers, um, and um, and and Sufis were, even though they may be removed from um, the the. Uh, the world of rulers and um, courts, um, they, they always um, um, benefited from the patronage of kings and rulers and princes um, and in turn um, uh, gave them the benefit of their blessings. Um, I mean, the most famous case is, you know, after Amir Khusro, the courtier and his relationship with Nizamuddin Olya, and, and later times we have the Mughals, um, and their relationship with the um, Chishti Sufis or the Qadiriya um, order in Lahore and Kashmir. Um, so there's always been, um, the, the Sufis have also been um, uh, a, a, a way in which Indo-Persian culture was um, spread and um, throughout the subcontinent um, and manifested itself in many local ways so that you have, um, you know, uh, the ways that uh, uh, Persian poems, for instance, may be um, used in the Kavali repertoire in different shrines, uh, would be different in different places depending on, um, and I would say that uh, the, you know, the presence of Amir Khusro is uh, strongest in Delhi, of course, um, and and, and uh, when you go away from the center, then you find that the repertoire can be quite different in um, Punjab or in the Deccan, for instance, in Kabbalis. Um, and um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, figures uh, who are important figures, um, whether poets or others who are important in the spread of um, Indo-Persian culture, 
um, throughout its long history. Um, I would say, of course, um, the, 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 the first name is Amir Khosrow, um, uh, because he was not just a poet, but also um, in many ways, um, much more than that, an ethnographer, a historian, an observer of life in, uh, um, in, uh, in, in uh, South Asia and different parts of India, um, but very much um, rooted in, in that kind of Persian, um, Perso-Islamic tradition, so that he, on the one hand, not only wanted to present the diversity of, um, of India to a larger world, a, a Persophone, a Persian-speaking world, outside India, but on the other hand, he wanted to make Persian um, um, literature and um, a way of uh, uh, thinking about the world and viewing the world, one could say a Persian humanistic um, uh, way of um, uh, life, um, very much part of the whole South Asian way of life to blend it um, into the local scene. And I think in that way, he was the most successful um, uh, proponent of Indo-Persian culture. Um, in later years, um, um, there have been uh, people like um, uh, Abul Fazl, um, Akbar's favorite courtier and historian in the Mughal period. Um, he, um, as much as Ami Khusro was uh, uh, very much interested in recording um, the, uh, the, the rich history and diversity of the subcontinent, but in a very much a Persian idiom, so that it would be accessible to um, people in the uh, larger Persianate world, we can say, but um, with a very distinctively um, Indo-Persian identity. Um, and, and so, you know, so on and so forth in later ages, you have people like um, um, Dara Shiko, of course, is very important um, in, in the whole uh, uh, process of translation and um, uh, interreligious dialogue, of course. Um, and later, um, you have figures like um, uh, um, Azad Bilgrami in the Deccan, um, who actually um, brought in the Arabic element um, in this as well, um, using Arabic as a medium um, of expression to um, explore um, uh, Indo-Persian culture. Um, his, uh, his explorations on, um, um, uh, and, and very much in a comparative mode of um, uh, the theory of love among Arabs versus Turks versus Persians and Indians is a fascinating um, work that he first wrote in Arabic and then translated a part of it into Persian. Um, so in that sense, um, very much part of this um, Indo-Persian world. Um, and then um, I think after him, you have figures like um, um, Ghalib, of course, um, because he, by his time, um, um, poets um, and humanists, um, historians and scholars, etc., were all bilingual, writing in um, uh, Persian and Urdu, um, so that um, what they were doing is um, uh, in their Persian writings, um, they were keeping in touch with this longer Persian, Indo Persian tradition that had connections to the world outside India, um, and then filtering it into, through Urdu, into a kind of a, uh, for lack of a better term, a vernacular mode. And this was happening in different languages as well. We're just now talking about um, kind of a, a more, uh, in, you know, Persian and Urdu-centric world. Um, but, uh, but, but this is uh, what was happening, um, especially in the, um, 19th and 20th centuries as Persian um, gave way to Urdu and other languages um, in the subcontinent, that whole Indo-Persian legacy um, had to be kind of funneled into um, the different 
languages, um, local languages um, uh, uh, of, of South Asia. Um, and this was done um, quite successfully for a long time, of course, at the cost of Persian. But I think by then, um, in, the, in the 19th century, uh, or even before, there was an official end to Persian. I think um, uh, uh, thinkers and um, you know uh, humanists of the time had realized that um, in the long run, Persian was really a classical language um, in the subcontinent, and that for a vibrant Indo-Persian or Persianate culture um, to um, be sustained and remained active, it would have to be done in in different languages such as Urdu, Bengali, Kashmiri, um, and, and, and other you know um, languages um, uh, around the subcontinent, Sindhi, of course. In terms of um, the kind of aesthetics that were developed in Indo-Persian, would you say that the aesthetics of Indo-Persian literature or culture are somewhat unique, uh, uh, they are different from the purely Persian or purely Indian. For example, in poetry, there is a particular style uh, which was developed in India. That's a very difficult question, actually, and, um, and which doesn't mean that one should not try to um, answer it. Um, and it, um, it, I think, is basically the, uh, at the heart of Indo-Persian culture. Um, and, and one doesn't need to distinguish entirely between that this is Persian or Iranian and this is um, Indo-Persian. Um, uh, there can be many areas of ambiguity and, and the whole point of aesthetics is in ambiguity. As we know for um, the, you know, um, the world of the Ghazal, for instance, the ambiguity of the beloved, um, whether it's God or an earthly beloved, or the gender of the beloved, um, the, the whole beauty of that lies in its ambiguity. And so I think um, um, uh, that can be true of Indo-Persian aesthetics as well. But as scholars, yes, it is our job to try to understand how this literature that was uh, produced in the subcontinent, um, how was it distinct from literature, say, produced in um, in Isfahan or Bukhara, where Persian was more of a kind of, it was the local language where it was, um, you know, um, I don't want to say Persian was not um, an Indian language. It definitely was and is one of our classical languages. But, um, uh, but the way that, you know, in a society I've seen where uh, Persian can be spoken at the most ordinary level by people on the street, there's a very different aesthetics um, to the to culture, to music and poetry, um, um, even architecture, that in a society where there is, um, 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 you know, Persian has much more of an elite status, which it did. Um, you know, it was um, never a language of the people. It it had something special about it at all times, and I think um, uh, that's what distinguishes it. Um, uh, from the literature of, um, of, of what we would call um, uh, the, the Persian speaking world. Um, so what you find right from the beginning, um, and I can speak more about poetry um, and um, a little bit about painting, um, uh, is that, um, uh, that uh, poets and artists like to surprise you so that you have a, you know, a poem written in um, um, in Persian from, uh, by Masood Saad Salman, one of the earliest uh, poets of, the, of Lahore um, and um, Ghazni of the um, 11th and 12th centuries, um, and written in a very, um, very much, you know, traditional kind of um, uh, Persian mold. Um, and then suddenly you have, um, you know, a description of a beloved and you see that the beloved um, beloved um, teeth are st or mouth is stained red because um, he or she has been chewing pan. And that very much locates a poem in, um, in, in, in a certain milieu. Um, and um, the rest of the poem would have 
nothing to indicate that this was not written in, in any other part of the Persian world, but just a little clue like that. Or another Persian um, poem by Masood Saad Salman, where he writes about um, going to um, visit his, um, or being parted from his beloved in the time of the monsoon. And he uses the word um, barshakal so that we know it's not just any rain, as a day of, of course, there's rain in Iran as well, and uh, so that it's not a, um, a day of uh, spring rain. In, you, in, a, in a Persian poem, usually you have um, a, a, a rain coming on a spring day during no ruse. But you have very much that um, the poet is taking leave of his beloved on a day that is a day of monsoon in the way we know it today as well, where all life kind of comes to a stop and there's a torrential rain and, um, and, and he describes such a scene. So um, it is unusual, such scenes are unusual, but not more unusual than say, Persian poetry being written at the, around the same time in the medieval period in, um, um, in the Caucasus region, um, northwest of Iran, the other kind of the, the frontier of Persian poetry, um, where you have a poet like Khakan, Khakani um, in Sherwan, um, who writes about church bells, hearing church bells, and, um, and church spires, and um, the Christian beloved. So, um, but that is really, we call it Persian poetry. We don't say it's, um, you know, it, we don't give it a special name. Um, as such, but but uh, there is something I think um, you know distinctively Indo-Persian in this way. Um, in when we look at aesthetics, as you have said, um, and throughout the tradition, um, you will find this, and it shows up in different ways, not just in descriptions of the beloved, but um, very often um, the Persian garden that is described in poetry. Um, we ex expect certain elements in that Persian garden, the gul and bulbul, um, of course, are there. But then in um, later times, for instance, in um, some of um, Amir Khosrow's writings or in Mughal poetry, um, you have a garden in which there's not only the gul and bulbul and the usual um, kind of um, plants and flowers, but suddenly you have um, a different kind of um, landscape you have um, sort of what we would call Indian birds and flowers and trees, the keura and the Malsri and um, um, the mena, etc. And you know that um, this is, uh, you know, this is a different kind of garden in a Persian poem. Um, and would a reader or a listener of such a poem derive pleasure from this poetry um, if they are located in Shiraz or um, um, Samarkand, I don't know. Perhaps not as much as a as an audience in in the subcontinent would derive pleasure, because they see in the poem um, uh, something um, of uh, what they themselves live. That is a coming together of the Persian and Indian worlds. So they um, they see that happening on a uh, you know, in a, in a very kind of, in an aesthetic mode as well in poetry. And we see this in painting as well. This is uh, much clearer in painting than in poetry actually. Um, for instance, if we look at um, painting from Safavid Iran, um, illustrations to a divan of Hafez, um, and you have an idealized garden. Again, the, um, you have the beloved sitting um, in a, you know, on a carpet in a garden. And um, uh, the, the idea is to show a very idealized world, um, uh, a very abstract world that, that we find in, um, uh, in, in a Persian um, poetry. Um, but say a, uh, the same kind of work illustrated in, um, in um, India by one of the artists of the Mughal court um, would have a very different um, depiction of that that iconic garden scene 
uh, where not only you have that kind of realism for which Mughal uh, painting is known for, um, but you have a different aesthetics in terms of um, the trees um, uh, in the garden, um, the beauty of the beloved and the lover, etc. So that, um, uh, it, it, in, as I said, in painting, it's very clear. We can see that this, the setting for this, is an um, you know is an Indo-Persian um, setting. Whereas in poetry, um, you have to look much more carefully to find these clues. Um, but they are there definitely, um, and I think. Um, uh, this is, as I said, this is where the challenge of scholarship lies in trying to, um, uh, not to, as I said, to distinguish between Iranian and Indo-Persian, um, but, but to understand that how um, uh, by modifying the, the traditional repertoire of poetry or art through the aesthet aesthetics, um, uh, how it would give pleasure and how that changed because this would have been different in the you know, 13th and 14th centuries from the 16th and 17th and then the 19th. Um, even that, um, the, 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 the aesthetic um, formation would have been very different over time as Indo-Persian culture evolved and transformed continuously.